So uh, we have, uh, so when we were discussing which topics we should cover uh, today, uh, one, one of the first topics that came to mind was fake news. Uh, I purposely didn't invite a moderator to moderate this uh, conversation because I know everyone has an opinion or a question about fake news. So I will invite our speakers who have uh, uh, very good experiences, but one in Brazil, the other one here in the US, and I'm so very honored that they will be joining us right now. First of all, Annie Ravel, so great to have you back at Bay Brazil event. Annie Ravel is a professor at Berkeley. <laughs> She's a professor at uh, Berkeley Law School. She was also a former FEC, Federal Election Commission, under Obama. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about that. And I also want to join me here, please, inviting Alana Rizzo from Albright Stony Ridge. Uh, Alana Rizzo. I'll, besides... Um, uh, being now with Albright, uh, Alana, before that, was also an investigative reporter uh, for Revista Veja. So I'm so glad to have you here. Please sit down, Ana. Please sit down. Uh, so I just have like a one or two warm-up questions, and then I want to uh, pass to your questions. Um, and tell us a little bit about your background, your story, and your experience. So the reason uh, our, our board members and I, when we were discussing the topics of the conference, we included this subject because, of course, there are elections coming up in the U.S., and there are elections coming up in Brazil. And we know how fake news uh, can actually impact uh, election results. So, and tell us a little bit about your work and then we jump into your vision about the fake news. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And um, I have to say, we discussed this and I'm gonna speak in Portuguese and you're gonna speak in English, right? <laughs> no. Um, my background is I've worked in government. This is something, this panel is going to be completely different from what you've had the rest of the-, the We like it different. I know. Um, I've been in government most of my life. I started working at Santa Clara County at the county council's office, ended up there. Then I went to the Department of Justice when President Obama asked me to go um, as an assistant attorney general, came back, worked for the California Fair Political Practices Commission, uh, appointed by Governor Brown, and then I went back uh, to work as the chair and also commissioner of the Federal Election Commission, which primarily does not have anything to do with elections per se, but it has to do more with the financing of elections. And now, among other things, I'm also working on a project with a nonprofit at, in Berkeley, Maplight, on uh, what I call digital deception, not fake news, um, because I actually think that the problem is more about clear political propaganda for the purpose of influencing elections and undermining our democracy. So it's a really important issue. Hi, everyone. Uh, Margarita, thank you very much for the invite. It's a big pleasure to be here. And I think uh, we were discussing before the panels, before uh, ours, was a lot about challenges, transportation challenges, health sector challenge, and we have a big challenge right here. We're discussing the political system that we have, that we want, we're discussing democracy. Uh, talking about misinformation, 
it's not only talking about po politics, it's not only talking about journalism, it's talking about uh, democracy. And I think that's something that we are all aware of it and we should, especially in the startup environment, we should start thinking about solutions for that. Uh, so it's a big pleasure to be here with such a great audience. Uh, as Margarita said, I'm a reporter, uh, I'm a journalist. I, w I worked as a, re a reporter in Brazil for the past 10 years in Brasilia, uh, doing investigative and political reporting, uh, covering elections. Thank God this one I'm not covering <laughs> on the ground. <laughs> right now I work for Albright uh, Stonebridge. It's a consulting company and we help uh, clients navigating the political uh, and the public sector and the political environment. So guess you guys guess a lot of work I have back in Brazil trying to make uh, Americans understand what's going on in Brazil and Brazilians understand what's going on in America. So it's a lot of ta it's a big challenge. Um, I think this is going to be more an open uh, session and an open discussion. But I think there's a couple of things that we should start talking about. And one of the, uh, one of it, and we were talking behind behind the scenes. Where the big question is, are we doing enough? And we all agree that not none. The tech companies are not doing enough. Soci civil society is not doing enough. Policymakers are not doing enough, and I think uh, we have to think: what, ca what else can we do, and how we can uh, avoid misinformation, and how we can we we can think about it and then solutions for it. I'm gonna bring a little bit of uh, data of Brazil. Everyone here knows what happened yesterday, and Bolsonaro got stabbed. And in everyone uh, is familiar with, with what happened yesterday. Uh, the Americans or non-Americans uh, present. I thought it was fake news. <laughs> See, <laughs> right? <laughs> Did you really? I, I really thought because uh, I, I didn't. I woke up this morning and I just saw a link and I said, you know, it must be this some fake news because I'm far from Brazil. And Yes, and you're not the only one. Like uh, from yesterday until now, you had 3.2 million mentions of the case of the stabbing in Twitter. 40% of it said it was fake. It wasn't true. So it's it's not uncommon. People are still thinking. There's a lot of uh, memes and things saying like, I don't see the blood, so it's fake. You can see the video. You see the video. He got stabbed in front of tons of people, but people still think it's fake. It's not. It, it, it didn't happen. And this is. Uh, uh, this is him pretending that he got stabbed so he can win the elections. So I think it's a huge challenge that we have in front of us right now. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so before I open up to your questions, my last question before that. Um, so uh, yesterday, the day before yesterday, Twitter and Facebook were in the Congress and we had a hearing with these companies and our tech companies doing enough, if they are not, what else can they do to avoid misinformation? Well, first let's say that it's not just a burden on the tech companies. I think as you mentioned, it's important not only for tech companies, but for civil society and government to be looking at solutions to the problem. But definitely, the tech companies are not doing enough. And even though Jack Dorsey and you know they went to Congress and said, "Mia culpa, we agree, we didn't do enough, and we want to do more," the things that they have proposed to do are not solutions. They're not going to deal with the problem. Facebook, in particular which we all know has a business plan that is intended to spread the kind of things that, that people are now believing. Um, because the more clicks they get, the more they get money. And so their business plan is that. They am, Facebook embedded in campaigns and told them how to use micro-targeting. And that micro-targeting isn't just I'm taking your information from Facebook and then I'm going to use it to determine whether you agree with a particular political view or not. No, the micro-targeting is taken from every contact in the internet and Facebook gave it to them and then 
told them, number one, by using Cambridge Analytica, which by the way now has an office in Sao Paulo, um, just for those of you who <laughs> might be wondering about that. Mm -hmm. And it, it, um, it, it actually shows them exactly what the emotional proclivities are of each of the people that is utilizing the platform and other information also on the internet and whether or not they are susceptible to certain particular kinds of micro-targeting. And that's what Cambridge Analytica did, thanks to Facebook in, in many regards. And they did it in the United States elections um, at particular places along, there's been, there's a, um, professor at Wisconsin, her name is Young Mi Kim, and she did a study of all Facebook ads that during a certain period before the election and a little bit after, many of them were Russian ads. Most of them were racist, clearly racist, clearly anti-immigrant, and they were set in places that there was a possibility of altering the election results. And this is, you know, a, a pretty pervasive act that they did. And they now are saying, well, we're going to ask people who get ads on Facebook to show their driver's licenses before they can buy an ad. Well, we know from the Mueller indictment that a lot of Americans bought ads because they were being paid for paid by Russians to buy those ads. So those kinds of things and having some of the ads on or all the ads even on their um, on their platform that you can observe, it, that's not easy to for most Americans to go on and find out who's really trying to influence their vote. Alana, your view on what the tech companies are doing or not doing? So I think uh, I agree with, with Anne. Like they're not doing enough, uh, and we are not. We're all not doing enough. Uh, so for, uh, from the point of view of different tech companies, you can see Facebook uh, has this uh, project with fact-checking agencies all over the world, and we were discussing this. Is is this enough? Is this helpful? Uh, there, there is uh, different data saying that it helps in some point, in some places it does not help in others. And what, what, what we, what I see is that we, we have to start creating kind of like uh, education programs. Like people have to understand that they cannot share. It, it's a shared responsibility. It's not only for the platforms. Like uh, fact checking, who goes to fact checking websites to check the information they receive? One here, like <laughs> two. Okay, so like, uh, where do you get that? Uh, where where do you see news? Pretty much sixty percent of all those uh, in Brazil and in developed countries, they see news in social media. In, in Brazil, right now, it's WhatsApp, but it's Facebook, it's Twitter. So I think uh, the pl platforms, of course, they have a big responsibility for that, especially because bots, for example, that's a big thing in Brazil. Uh, Anne was telling me that I didn't know seventy percent of Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want to. Seventy percent of uh, the bots all over there in Brazil, right? Right. The the there's been a recent group that analyzed all of the bots that are used. Not there's some good bots, but these are bots that are used for malicious purposes. And Brazil is fourth in the world uh, for the number of bots, and they analyzed that there were about five hundred thousand bots in Brazil that were being used to spread fake news and malicious information, mostly to be used against opponents in campaigns. Yeah, so that's, that's it. I didn't know about that. Like, I knew, you know that bots are all over, but come on, we're the fourth country in the world that has bots. So platforms, of course, have a responsibility for this. And also, I think uh, one of the big challenges is transparency. I think when platforms shut down, 
websites or shut down uh, community pages and uh, account, Twitter accounts and kind of those kind of things. I think it's important that we all know why they're shutting, what's the policy of the company. That's something I think we as civil society have to engage and have to understand so we can have it clear why are they shutting this account, not the other one, and what's behind the scene. I think transparency is something that tech companies can work a little bit better on that. And can I add that um, the importance of having government regulation also it can't be underestimated. The United States has no laws at all on the books relating to social media and social and platforms, none. And as a result, and in, in addition, I did campaign finance where in the United States, transparency is an underlying um, ethic of campaigns. But actually, the ability to spread information to do propaganda, to do ads on the internet is totally unregulated and still remains unregulated to this day. There's not, despite what we know about what happened in the 2016 election. And the problem is the platforms, they, they first off, you can't rely on them to enforce what they're, whatever it is that they're offering to do. And then secondly, each one of them is offering to do something different. And the people, and particularly reporters, so that people can have truth in their governmental processes, should be able to get all the same information from every platform. Because as you said, in Brazil, in 2016, I think, 95% of Brazilians used um, Facebook as their major, except, you know, my family, which used well, like 100% of their time was on Facebook. Um, but now it's gone to most of the chat apps, including WhatsApp. Right. So, uh, you know, it's really important that there be consistency and that there be enforcement. And it's, uh, when you go to uh, WhatsApp, for example, that's an even bigger challenge because then it's encrypted. Then you have no idea what's going on. There's a whole world here that we have no idea what's happening. People control tons and tons of WhatsApp groups. Uh, people, I don't know if you guys know this, but in Brazil now, uh, there are some people that are they're charging for you to get in WhatsApp group. They charge $10 per month so you can get in and receive the, ma the message that they're spreading. And we know that that's a lot of, uh, of the misinformation is going through those channels that no, no, one, no one sees. Well, I want to engage our audience. We have uh, quite a few questions right there. Uh, or Hold on just a second. The mic is going there. Please say your name and company. Hi, my name is uh, D. Tai, and I'm an attorney working uh, for myself. Uh, I want to ask uh, Ms. Ravel, um, you said there's no laws on the books for social media. Well, what do you think would happen if you just apply the same standards and responsibilities for old media to social media? Um, you know, one way I look at it is that Facebook and Twitter and, and Google and so forth uh, have basically put half of the traditional media um, and journalism industry out of business. That means a lot of fact checkers and editors um, who uh, you know, can be hired now to, to uh, uh, carry out the responsibilities of a media company. So would that be something uh, to be considered? I, I think you're right that that's at least a first step. And Congress has talked about something called the Honest Ads Act that would do just that. Of course, they talked about it eight months ago and have done nothing not surprisingly, but I think it's just a first step because one of the problems with the rules for the old media, and not to get too technical about this, but they're mainly about um, ads. They're not, not just that it has to be an ad placed on, on um, TV or, or radio, but also it, it has to apply to what's called um, certain communications that aren't specifically vote for or vote against, but the definition isn't strong enough f 
for social media because we know now, for example, and this is true, I know in Brazil in 2014, the minute that Duma was elected, uh, the bots began to spread false information on media about her in preparation for trying to unseat her. And so uh, it's the same with the election in, in 2016. Russia began their social media propaganda in 2014, at least that's as far as we know so far, maybe earlier. And what they're doing is clearly related to the election, but they're not referring to a particular candidate. They're referring more broadly to hot button issues that have to do with candidates, but it doesn't follow under the law. And so it needs to be a, a little broader for social media. I'd just like to add uh, something really quick. Uh, you said something about journalists could go to uh, tech companies to do the fact checking. The problem is journalists, is, it's an expensive business. Uh, Yes, I know. I'm saying it's it's an expensive co business for you, and it takes time. That's the problem. Ch fact check it's not as simple because you do use uh, artificial intelligence, but there's something behind that. It's human work. You know, like for example, you get spotlight. For example, it takes a year for you to do an uh, an article like that. For you, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of research, and that's why fact check um, agencies, for example. It takes, uh, they, can, they cannot check everything that's going on on um, social media. They fact check one, two, three, four stories uh, a day. For example, the Bolsonaro case, I was checking uh, the major fact checking agents in Brazil. They could check from yesterday until now, five stories. Can you imagine how many stories are going on right now in social media of Bolsonaro? Because it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of people to fact check. So it's not, I understand your, your point, but I, I don't know if it's that simple to have I, I, lots of journalists uh, in the tech companies, they're already doing it. And I think uh, one of the things that I think is super important is for we to become a little bit for fact checkers, you know, you have to educate people, especially kids and in schools, like it's about social media literacy. We have to understand that it's also your respons our responsibility. I was, uh, couple, there's a research uh, that was released, I think two months ago in Brazil, and 40% of people in Brazil, when they check, they go ask uh, friends or family. And so I think that's something that it's also our job to start training and educating. And I think it's tech companies' uh, responsibility to also educate people in social media literacy. Can I add one thing about Brazil? I yes. know <laughs> this is never, um, having to do with campaign finance laws applicable to the internet. Um, in Brazil, you know, those of you who are Brazilian probably know three months before the election, there can't be any ads that are promulgated. Um, however, they are now being promulgated. You're not supposed to do it in concert with somebody else, but once you do it on the internet and you do it through bots and you do it through other imposters, trolls and whatever, nobody knows. And so there's plenty of ads now on the internet in Brazil and that law d is not you know, good enough. Mm -hmm. I think we have a question right there. Another journalist, please Hi. say your name. <laughs> I'm Bruno Ferrari. I'm a Brazilian journalist living in the Bay Area. So my question is about the media companies. Uh, so media companies are facing a lack of credibility, especially uh, created by, like inside the social networks, not by the social networks, but people keep saying that, you know, uh, the newsrooms are full of leftists that want to implement the communism in Brazil. I used to work for Global and even Izami, which is really a liberal magazine in Brazil, and and people they don't believe in journalists anymore. That's the the reality. So, on the business side, uh, is there any positive scenario for? small startups, media startups. I mean, uh, is there any possibility to think about uh, being an attractive business since we have no credibility anymore, almost no credibility anymore, comparing to the, what the information that we can access in social media uh, networks, for example? 
I do know that in the United States now, there are more of the small local, there's one in California um, that um, has small local news that is really um, credible, but I think it's credible to only a small number of people. I think the problem is not so much with journalism, but journalism, like everything else, is what they're trying to undermine by spreading all this misinformation. For example, we were discussing this before, and I was kind of surprised when I read this, but it makes sense. Um, when Trump tweets about fake news, when he tweets about, um, you know, crooked Hillary or tweets about whatever it is and uses that terminology the way he uses it that's so extreme, that's like a dog whistle, essentially, to all of the people to pick up that meme and then keep promulgating it throughout the ether of the internet. And, and then it's used, in many cases, to go after and kill journalists it's used to um, abuse individuals who have um, crossed him in one way or the other. So it's a really insidious problem that, you know, I mean, it, it's not a direct answer to your question, but I think it's part of the whole universe of the problems that we're facing and why it's so immediate that we do something about it. And I think part of the solution could be uh, small newsrooms uh, uh, Taking taking uh, taking the uh, taking the space of uh, of course big newsrooms are always going to exist. You cannot uh, you see New York Times driving news are going up after Trump's ele election, and I think we we're going to see this in Brazil. It depends. I don't even think it depends on who is going to win. I think we're going to see a little bit of this uh, journalism getting back on track, especially when you when you think when you have crisis like this, because we all know that in the end we need good information and legacy media, it's the one who has money and time and people and talent, people to invest in big stories. We have a couple of questions here. Um, hi, my name is Christine Nazareth. I'm not a techie, I'm in entertainment and PR, but I've got a million things to say or comment and ask about that. I'm just gonna try to. Yes, what? Well, first of all, I think I agree with you that the onus is so much on us because it's almost impossible to navigate through all of that. And even if you had a thousand fact checkers, fact checkers doesn't mean anything because they fact check Trump every day and you just go tweet something wrong and everybody will repeat. But one thing that I think it's interesting that I've been getting a lot of my news from podcasts. And for example, there's a podcast called Spot Save America, which is for guys from Obama. And I went to an event here on a theater to watch these guys live, and it was sold out, and it was over a thousand seats. And it was to see four guys on a stage talking about politics. And all kids, you know. So I think that there is sort of like I have to appeal to different forms of, and you have to, like you say, friends and family. You almost have to find the people that you trust, right? And then that's where you get your news from because it's it's impossible to, like you were saying, the onus is on us. I thought something very interesting that, for example, Alex Jones, I don't know who knows who Alex Jones is, but whose guy would, you know, who's he's totally fake news, but Infowars, who's got this, who says that what happened in the, in uh, what is it? The kids in Sandy, who were killed. It was wrong and all of that. Well, Twitter would refuse, kept refusing, refusing to get him off the platform. So what happens is this woman called Shannon Coach or something who has something called Grab Your Wallet. She started this campaign of everybody, okay, don't pay or, or how can I say, uh, stop buying products from the companies that, uh, how can I say, that invest and She's getting all these people off the air. I mean, all of us, because then I go and say, okay, that's it. I'm boycotting this thing. I'm bo and that's, I think the society is now the only way that you can fight fake news. It's us getting involved. So can I say one thing? I, I agree with you, but I'm not sure that that's going to ultimately be the solution either, because one of the problems, we were talking about this, 
with AI now, and I know there's people here who are interested in AI, with the ability to have um, people that aren't really people, that look just like you and have that same smile and have the same voice and the same facial expressions, no one is going to be able to determine that. But maybe people in tech could actually figure out ways to make sure that we can check to see if it's actually a fake person or a real person. But, but most people, no matter how much they're thinking about it and caring about it, aren't going to be able to, to know that. Yes, they, they, can, they can make fake, you know, Trumps, they can make fake anybody. Let's bring then somebody that knows a little bit about that. And he has a question. I don't know anything about fake Trump, but <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, so the question I have is, uh, I, it, what I've seen on WhatsApp actually really scares me. And I think WhatsApp in some ways is, it's a, is even a bigger problem than, than Facebook. You mentioned it, it's all encrypted. So there's not a lot that Facebook actually can do uh, as opposed to regular Facebook. And, and one of the things that I notice is because I'm trying to figure out what's real and what's not, I have to like constantly be doing essentially almost like a, like a, a proto journalist work, right? So like, where's the source, right? Who's, what's the reputation of the source, right? And have to essentially do these types of things. Fact checking is great because they do that for me, but they don't have scale, right? So do you think that there is a need, since that we don't have this now anymore, like two or three media outlets that everybody listens to, like do we need some sort of reputation system or source of origin uh, system that basically tracks how this propagates? Because when it was just like cat videos, nobody cared, right? I mean, it goes viral, everybody's happy, but now it's no longer the case. I personally uh, believe in reputation systems. I think uh, that's, that, that's the only, uh, right now, I think that's one of the solutions that I think it could work. Especially, and you see that working in WhatsApp groups, for example, when you say, uh, when you say something to, in the beginning, you'd say, this is fake news in the WhatsApp group. And they'd be like, I don't care, I just think it's fun. Now, if you say something like, this is uh, fake, uh, please don't share it, people get embarrassed. People are like, oh, I'm sorry, they delete. Now that you have the delete button in WhatsApp, people delete. So I think this can help, especially if platforms start using it, uh, reputation system. Like if you rate, for example, uh, websites that spread, uh, spread fake new, uh, misinformation, fake news. In the, in, so I think, it, I think it can be a solution. I don't know, yeah. what do you think, Anne? I, I think it's also important to, you, you talked about the source. We don't really know the source of a lot of this. And what the platforms have agreed to do is not going to tell us who the source is. But I know, I mean, there are people who have said this. I'm, I'm not, you know, the clever person to say it. But, you know, people don't like to be duped. They don't like to think that what they believed is actually something totally false or that it actually came from China or Russia or rather than you know a, a credible person. So getting to the source of the original transmission and the transparency I think is really important. And there are people now who are looking at bots and how the bots are transmitted and some of them can, can find that. But there isn't a really good way now yet to figure out the original source. Okay, we have time for only one more question here. Your name and company. Um, so my name is Johnny Girardi. Um, dual citizenship, I've been here for 20 years, but from Brazil originally. Um, and I have an interesting perspective in this whole thing. Um, I'm independent, so I have voted for both sides. Um, I watch news from both sides. Every time there's something important, I read both sides. And I'm amazed when I talk with a lot of people, they only see, read one side. No matter what side you are, if you read only one side, you're missing part of the boat. And it's sometimes amazing the same fact you watch in two different you know, channels is completely different angle, and both are right and both are wrong. So what I decided to do myself is, since I cannot influence the media, right, I have my own problems. <laughs> uh, I have my kids, my friends, my employees, and 
every time that I talk with them about these important things that's going on in, in the US, in Brazil as well, um, depending on the audience, you know, if I'm talking with a person who is a Republican, my first thing is I go to their side. Yes, I agree. And I kind of, you know, get in the same boat as them. And then I start to talk about, well, what about this? What about that? Have you watched, have you read the other side of the, the, the news? And one thing I always tell, tell those people that has been very, very uh, helpful, I've, I've, I've seen is, do not watch channel news. Channel news is a show. They're there to sell advertising. They're very emotional. They're awesome. They're, they sell their things very well. Read the printed from the other side. If you like CNN, yes, keep on watching. If you want to watch Fox that you hate, don't watch the, 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 the TV, read the printed, because the printed is usually more unbiased, is more checked, is less emotional. And sure enough, in the last two, three years, I've seen that some of the people that have been influencing, they've been more in the middle. And that's what we need. We need to get out of our bubbles, whatever your bubble is, and find a way to talk without shouting, trying to find the middle, because both sides are right, both sides are wrong. And I think we individually, we need to bring the conversation to the middle. Uh, sometimes they swing, but every time I bring someone a little closer to the middle, even if, if I don't agree, I'm, I'm happy. So uh, I think our problem is not so much the technology because we don't control. It's hard to, to, to put rules around, but individually, at least my personal journey is to talk with the people around me and try to bring them closer to the middle, whatever the conversation is. So, sorry, it's not a question. I was just trying to put this. Yeah, and it's very controversial because uh, some of us were in broadcast new, news before, and some are in the printed news. I we we I have a colleague right there also that was in broadcast news. So please go ahead, Ian. Uh, well, I think it's true that. Um, their MSNBC is very left, and Fox News is obviously very right. But the problem that we now have, it seems, and, and you're right that people um, are polarized and that doing what you're doing is a wonderful thing. Um, it's kind of incremental. And the problem is that, as the gentleman in the back mentioned, People even think the mainstream press, the people who actually have to follow journalism ethics rules, like Washington Post and Wall Street Journal, they think those people are also biased. And so I think that, yes, what you're saying is right, but it's still, we have a problem. Alan, you have a comment? And she was in the printed uh, <laughs> media. <laughs> well, uh, we are uh, um, at the end of our panel, and I want to invite uh, Alana and, um, and thank you, Chris, uh, to just do final comments on what, us, what can we do as a citizens with these two elections coming up in Brazil and in the US? What can we do as a citizen to? Uh, be careful with uh, the information we consume and the information that we spread. I kind of see things more globally. For one thing, we didn't get to talk about this, but this is a global problem. And personally, I think that this is a problem in the Americas, too, and that we should try to get our house in order. And so those of you who vote in Brazil or those of you who vote in the United States, we should all be talking to our elected officials about how important this is and and you know making it a signature issue because it really is it's um, you know we were talking and I I think the house is on fire I really do I think it's our democracy is in danger and so every one of the why people aren't more alarmed is alarming to me um, so people need to put pressure on those people who are responsive either to votes or to political pressure or whatever to address this problem. And we need to do it. I'm going to be in Brazil observing your elections um, soon, and I'm going to talk to some people there about these issues because really I think it's something we all have to look at. We'll invite you back after this. Thank you. Again. Mm -hmm. I, totally, I, I totally agree with Anne. The house is on fire, <laughs> and I think we have a lot to do, and we have to we have to be a little bit more engaged on this. This is not something that it's 
uh, outside our lives. So it's everyday life and it's everyday business. Like uh, every company right now has a problem with fake news and misinformation. You can see big companies that are not media companies I have a, or tech companies have a problem with Adidas has one, had one two weeks ago. Uh, Nike had a hate speech problem last week. So it is our problem. It's a global problem. And I would say for everyone that it's here, and especially for the startups, uh, let's start thinking about solutions on this. And please don't share information if you don't know the source and if you don't know where it came from. Fact check before or, it, or just don't share it. Thank you. Thank you, Aliana. Thank, Thank you. you.